This video is sponsored by Tokyo Treats and Sakurako. Hey everyone, CJ here. It's time to talk about our boy Kong Ming. Full name, Zhuge Liang. On this video, I'm going to explain the difference between the historical person and the fiction in its various forms, folk stories, romance of the Three Kingdoms, and the anime. For context, I will also explain how the Three Kingdoms literature became so popular in Japan. Let's start with something simple, the name. Kong Ming is actually just his courtesy name. His full name is Zhuge Liang. His surname, Zhuge, is placed in front because that's the convention used in East Asia. Courtesy name or style name is a name ancient Chinese people receive or picked for themselves when they became an adult at 20 years old. It was impolite to call people by their given name unless you are their elder or superior. So if you are an adult of the same generation, then you should call someone by their courtesy name. But since they are historical figure and you're not addressing them directly, you can just call them by their given name. The practice of using courtesy name was pretty common in Confucian-influenced cultures, such as China, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan. But it is rarely practiced anymore. In Japan, for some reason, Japanese more commonly refer to him as Kong Ming or Kome as it is pronounced in Japan. Perhaps because Zhuge Liang, when pronounced in Japanese, Shokatsuryo, was just too long and unwieldy to use in normal conversation. But for your boy Kong Ming anime, I think using Kong Ming is a really clever choice because it insinuates that he is in the same generation as you. He is not some stuck-up historical figure. He is your buddy. I think the author of this series has done a lot of research. Take the heroine of the show, Eiko, for example. Some of you have pointed out that she is based on Kong Ming's wife. In folk stories, she is called Huang Yueying because of the first characters of her name, which can be read as Yueying in Chinese, I think that connection holds. But it actually goes much deeper than that. In the historical records, her actual name was never recorded. But there is a record of her father, Mr. Huang, offering her hand in marriage to Kong Ming. He said that she was ugly but talented and she had yellow head and black color. Some people took this phrase to mean that she was blonde and had dark skin. If you look at Eiko, she also has blonde hair. And I think in place of dark skin, they gave her a black hat instead. In the anime, the reason that Kong Ming chose to serve her was because she was talented. She is not ugly here, but I think they are dressing her down with less glamorous clothing. According to some local legend in central China, she was a genius inventor who created wooden doll robots that processed wheat. According to the same legend, it was also she who taught Kong Ming the technology, so he could invent the wooden ox flowing horse. Some people used to think that he invented wooden ox robots that transports provisions, but researchers have concluded that it was just a new wheelbarrow design. The ox version was pulled from the front and the flowing horse was pushed from the back. This might be a spoiler, but I think there is no way that Eiko will end up with anybody else besides Kong Ming. There are just too many illusions that she is his wife. The thing about these ancient records is that even though we can still read Chinese characters today, a lot of the context may be misunderstood by modern readers. Like the yellow head description for Kong Ming's wife, for example. It did not necessarily mean that she was actually blonde. Yellow hat, Huang Tou, was just an idiomatic expression that means young girl. I am not surprised if she actually had dark skin though, because Asians, including Chinese, do tan easily and have a wide variety of skin tone. But of course, their standard of dark may be quite different to Western standards. In general, Japan actually has a pretty good grasp of the Three Kingdoms, historically and narratively because Japan had a very strong cultural connection to the Three Kingdoms and the fiction was also one of Japan's most important cultural imports. And since we are on the topic of cultural imports, let's move on to this side and talk about the video's sponsor. Tokyo Treats and Sakurako are two different genres of monthly subscription snack boxes delivered straight from Japan to your door. If you go for Tokyo Treats, you will get a chock full of popular Japanese candies and snacks. When I was in Japan, these are the stuff I would usually find in convenience stores and local supermarkets. It is pretty much what your average Japanese people would eat on a regular day. With Sakurako, you get more authentic traditional Japanese snacks from local artisans and snack makers. 
plus a tableware like this. So you can pretty much experience different slices of Japan without having to leave your apartment. The theme of the snacks changes monthly, so you won't get bored. This month, for example, you get the summer Matsuri theme for your Tokyo Treats box. See this Japanese exclusive cookie and cream ice cream Kit Kat? Best served frozen, it says. Don't worry if you don't understand Japanese. The booklets will explain the snacks to you. The same goes for the Sakura Co box. This month's theme is tea time in Yokohama, and the snacks are a range of Yoshoku snacks, which are really Western snacks which had been localized into Japanese taste over a hundred years ago. Just like this Dorayaki, the favorite snack of a certain animated blue robot cat. What I like best about these Japanese snacks is that they are usually not too sweet, which is the best compliment an Asian can give to snacks. So give them a try. Use the link and code in the description to get extra free snacks and it will also help the channel. Okay now, back to our boy Kong Ming. In East Asia, Kong Ming is the poster boy for wisdom, intelligence, and loyalty. But his image had actually evolved through time. The earliest record of him in history was from the Records of the Three Kingdoms, written by Chen Shou and annotated by Pei Songzi later. There were also various Three Kingdoms folktales and opera that had been performed before they are collected into folktales collections and later novelized by Luo Guanzong. But the story never stopped evolving, and the version that most Chinese people are familiar with is actually Ma Zhongkang's edited version, San Guo Yan Yi, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. This is the version that has the quote, The empire long united must divide, long divided must unite. This is how it has always been. This had been mistakenly attributed to Luo Guanzong. In Luo's earlier version, this passage did not exist. I have covered the evolution of the Chinese version in a previous video, so you can check it out. For this video, I will focus on the Japanese version and how Kong Ming's image evolved through time. Japan actually had access to the Records of the Three Kingdom History book over a thousand years ago. By the way, you need to be careful with the title in Japan. They use the same kanji for the history book and the story, so it can get confusing sometimes. The history book have a massive historical value in Japan because it provided the first written record on Japan and it mentioned the Wa people, Yamatai, and Queen Himiko. They had been aware of this story for a long time, but the first Three Kingdoms boom only happened during the peaceful Edo period, after the warring Sengoku period ended. Now that the common population of Japan have more free time for entertainment, they discovered the vernacular Three Kingdom fiction that's been imported from China. The Sakoku policies that closed Japan actually allowed trade with a few countries, including China. That's why Edo period writers gave Three Kingdom nicknames to some of their generals, like how Takenaka Hanbei was called the Kongming of today. But for most modern Japanese, the version they are most familiar with is Yoshikawa Eiji's modernized version, Sangokushi. Eiji was a master at historical fiction. He rewrote the new Musashi stories, Three Kingdoms, Water Margin, Tale of Heike, and other classic Japanese and Chinese literature. It was serialized for mass consumption on Japanese newspapers. So obviously, there are going to be some discrepancies between the Chinese version and the Japanese version. The biggest difference starts with Eiji Yoshikawa's source material. He did not use Ma Zhongkang San Guo Yan Yi as his source material. He used another version that's based on the folk tales of the Three Kingdoms that's been translated into Japan in the late 17th century. So the Three Kingdoms in Japan is a side evolution of the Three Kingdoms narrative in China. That is why it did not start with the famous phrase, the empire long divided must unite, long united must divide. Thus it has ever been. Another big difference is that the story ends after the death of Kong Ming, making him the final hero of the Three Kingdoms. In Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it was only the 105th chapter. There are another 15 chapters for a total of 120. The part after his death was just excruciating. It is like watching everything your heroes had worked for fall and got taken over by another party, Jing Dynasty. But it is important for the narrative because Romance of the Three Kingdoms is a narrative about the rise and fall of empires, the cycle of dynasties, while Sangokushi is the rise and fall of heroes, with the last one being Kong Ming. So your boy Kong Ming started exactly where Sangokushi ended. 
By the way, I have a summarized series on the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. You can check it out here if you want. AG also made some of his own adjustments, of course, making his version distinctly his. For example, Cao Cao is portrayed in a more sympathetic light. That is why there are more Cao Cao fans in Japan. The supernatural elements is further reduced, and there is a funny spelling mistake that slipped in. Xia Hu Tun's name is miswritten as Xia Hu Tun. That is why Yokoyama Mitsuteru's Sangokushi manga also has the same mistake because it's based directly on Yoshikawa Eiji's version. Interestingly, Yokoyama's manga continued past Koming's death up to the fall of Su, which is chapter 119 of the novel. But then, the anime version of Yokoyama Mitsuteru manga stopped right after the Battle of Red Cliff. I think the reason for this is because it is not fun for the average audience to see their heroes fall one by one. Yokoyama's design is very influential in Japan too. If you look at Yaboi Kongming's mustache, you can see that it looked exactly just like Yokoyama's version. I can continue talking about textual comparison for hours, but I just don't want to make this video too long, so let's move on. Despite having the image of being a closed society, Japan is actually very receptive to new narratives. Besides Chinese classics, there was also a boom in Western literature and detective novels in the early 20th century, leading to an explosion of detective fiction, with Edogawa Rampo being the poster boy for this. His name is also used by Conan in Detective Conan, in case you're wondering. The Arslan Senki novel series was based on the Persian epic Amir Arsalan, and the R.G. Veda manga was based on the Indian epic Rig Veda. The Japanese capacity for textual absorption would make for a very interesting field of study, I would say. But that's a subject for another time. I will do one on water margin in a future episode and talk about how it strongly influenced Japanese manga and anime. For now, let's just jump into the comparison between the historical Kongming and the fictional version. Through centuries of storytelling, the fictional Kongming had become the archetype of intelligence, wisdom, and loyalty. But he is really a collection of various existing archetypes put together to make him the ultimate good guy. Kim, despite being so capable, decided to serve Liu Bei's son instead of taking the kingdom of Su for himself. This makes him as virtuous as the Duke of Zhou, Duke of Zhou was the originator of the Confucian rituals of ethic. Confucius, as he admitted himself, did not invent anything. He was just propagating the ethic of the ancient lords to the population. So this means that Kong Ming was depicted to have the virtue of a saint. He seems to fit this in the anime too. How Zhuge Liang waited for the right lord to come to him also mirrored Jiang Ziya, the advisor of King Wen and Wu, who established the Zhou dynasty. According to the legend, he was fishing with a straight hook as he waited for King Wen to recruit him. He wasn't trying to catch anything, he was waiting for a willing lord to seek him out. Jiang Ziya was also the author of the Six Secret Teachings, the oldest and the longest of the seven military classics, predating Sun Tzu's Art of War. But this time, he offered himself to be Eiko strategist. I think this is due to her being a character based on his wife. His genius in formulating war strategies also mirrored Zhang Liang, one of the three heroes of the Han Dynasty, the strategist and tactician of Liu Bang, the first emperor of the Han Dynasty. He was famous for devising a victorious strategy in a tent 1,000 li away from the battle. He is also the origin of the pretty boy strategist archetype in East Asian literature. I made a video about it previously. Zhuge Liang also have a bit of a mean streak. I like how the anime didn't forget this and just made him a complete boy scout. But just a little correction. This sort of beheading and head display is mostly done in Japanese warfare. Samurais were paid by the numbers of heads they collect in battle and superior officers often inspect heads like this. In China, they don't usually display the heads of enemy officers in public. But for tyrants and really unpopular people, they would do much worse things, like mincing them into bits and things YouTube wouldn't let me mention. Just read about what they did to Dong Zhuo after he died. In the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel, he was quite the devilish figure who keep writing up military contracts, making his generals live up to their boasting or they will be executed. Ma Su, his subordinate, was executed because he had signed a military contract and he can't change his own rule, or it would be unfair to everyone else. So, the Kong Ming in the anime was pretty much accurately based on the fictional version of him. 
Historically, he was known to be very strict with rules too. But there are no records of him using military contracts. He applied his laws in the legalist style and claims that the people of Su had become too soft after being mismanaged by Liu Zhang, the previous administrator. He can't win them over by kindness like Liu Bang, he said. Despite implementing tough laws, however, he was respected because he applied it fairly. The historical Zhu Liang wasn't that much of a battlefield tactician. He was more of a diplomat and administrator. He was the Xiao He of Liu Bang instead of Zhang Liang. Xiao He was another one of the three heroes of Han Dynasty. While everyone else was out fighting wars, he was the one who managed the civil affairs and keeping the kingdom running. In fact, in his evaluation by the historian who wrote the records of the three kingdoms, Chen Shou, Zhuge Liang was also compared to Xiao He. In Chinese literary works and history, they really like to refer to past figures. It can be quite confusing to new readers unless you have received Confucian education and is familiar with Chinese history. But to be fair, English can be like this too sometimes, with terms like Herculean, Socratic, and Cartesian. One very famous scene in the novel where he used the empty fort strategy may not have happened in history. In that scene, he was caught near defenseless in a fort, bringing with him only a small group of soldiers, while his nemesis, Sima Yi, brought a whole army with him. So Zhuge Liang bluffed his enemy by opening the city's gate and showing some weak soldiers and street sweepers. It looked too suspiciously easy for Sima Yi, so he retreated because he was suspecting a trap behind it. This episode was actually rumored to be true since at least the 3rd century because Guo Chong, the official of Qing Dynasty, used this story to criticize Zhuge Liang for being careless. The historian who annotated Record of the Three Kingdoms, Pei Songzi, thought that it was an unreliable story, but he still mentioned it in his annotation just to debunk it. Interestingly, it was actually Cao Cao who used a similar strategy against Lü Bu in history. Zhuge Liang was a great minister, but he was just blown out of proportion in the novel. The novels are often considered to be seven parts history and three parts fiction, and it is the reordering of the events that makes it fictional. A lot of the achievements by other generals were given to Zhuge Liang. In the novel, the Battle of Bo Wang was moved to 208, where Zhuge Liang won the day by brilliantly laying out his plan to draw Cao Cao's army and burn their provision, forcing them to retreat. Historically, this event actually took place in 202, way before Zhuge Liang joined Liu Bei. It was also Liu Bei who came up with that strategy. But I guess I can understand why they changed the order of events. It was supposed to be Zhuge Liang's first battle, and it would make a more dramatic story if he started his career with a brilliant victory. In the Battle of the Red Cliff, historically, it was Zhou Yu who did most of the work and planning. All Zhuge Liang did was convincing the Kingdom of Wu to ally with them against Cao Cao. It was still impressive since they've got nothing to offer, but we can see how later authors play favorites with him. In the novel, there was an event where he collected arrows by tricking Cao Cao's fleet into shooting arrows at his boat, and he thanked Cao Cao after he got all the arrows he needed. In the earlier folk tales, it wasn't Zhuge Liang who used this ploy, it was actually Zhou Yu. But to be fair, there is no historical record of this event ever happening at all. The part about him not taking the throne despite being offered and opting to serve Liu Bei's son instead was historically true. He was depicted to be very firm and upstanding in his administration. But historically, that wasn't always true. Even he had to bend to factionalism within Su. The kingdom of Su was won by his lord Liu Bei when Fa Zheng betrayed his former lord Liu Zhang and conspired to give it to Liu Bei. So after acquiring Su, Fa Zheng became Liu Bei's most trusted man. After taking over, Fa Zheng started punishing people he had grudges against and he was being quite cruel. Zhuge Liang could do nothing but watch because Fa Zheng was Liu Bei's favorite at the time. Personally, I suspect that part of the reason that he kept leading his armies on northern expedition against Wei was for his own political safety. As long as the army is on his side, they can't launch a coup against him. The fictional Zhuge Liang is what I would call a crowdsourced hero. His legend grew even more powerful as more people tell his story. We can see his growth through the different versions of him. In the folktale version, he was actually quite savage. 
he straight up pulled out the sword and killed Cao Cao's messenger instead of having proper debate at Wu before the Battle of Red Cliff. In that version, he was also a straight up sorcerer too, summoning winds left and right. It is kinda understandable because the folk tales were mostly consumed by less educated people and kids who wanted more action and spectacle. In the various novel versions, he gradually became less and less supernatural and more sophisticated. In Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it wasn't explained how he could call the wind at the Battle of the Red Cliff. It could be magic or a trick, who knows. In Yoshikawa Eiji's version, it was explained that he had predicted the weather pattern. And Zhuge Liang's legend just kept getting more and more polished as new media was being put out. In the 2017 drama, The Advisor's Alliance, he was depicted to be more godly, even though the protagonist of the show was his nemesis, Sima Yi. At the Empty Fort incident, Zhuge Liang had calculated all of his enemy circumstances and situation. He made Sima Yi unable to attack, not because he tricked him into thinking that there is an ambush, but it was because he made it too easy, and Sima Yi would be promoted too quickly if he managed to capture Zhuge Liang. At the time, Sima Yi had a lot of enemies in court. If he got promoted too quickly, his enemies would get jealous and kill him since they wouldn't need him to fight Zhuge Liang anymore. So the both of them were thinking 10 steps ahead, and Zhuge Liang knew that Sima Yi needed him to be alive to survive his court factionalism. Zhuge Liang, Kong Ming, had become what John Baudrillard would call a second order simulacra, an unfaithful copy that reveals the truth that is important to us. Sometimes we need a superhero who is loyal and righteous that represents the pinnacle of intelligence. And Zhuge Liang is that vessel for our desire. That's why his legend will keep growing as more media about him is produced. In my opinion, I don't think that it matters who or where the media is produced, China or Japan. Just so you know, a good chunk of the Arthurian romance was actually written in France. Lancelot was a character created by a French poet. In fact, why don't you, those who are watching this video, try to write a Three Kingdoms inspired story too? Anyway, if you want more contents on history and literature, press the subscribe button. I will be doing a video on Water Margin or Sui Goten in the future and how it influenced Japanese literature, manga, and anime. I would also like to thank my patrons on Patreon and also Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for making this video possible. Remember that their link is in the description section. Until next time, stay cool my bros!